register there if you're if you'd like. Um, tonight's Zoom lecture is being recorded and it will be posted on our website in the coming weeks. We'll send out a link to everybody who's registered for tonight's event once the uh, video is ready. Um, tonight, you'll be hearing about cataracts, the current state of cataract surgery and current options in the patient journey. First, you'll hear from Dr. Marjan Farid, who's the Director of Cornea, Cataract, and Refractive Surgery and the Ocular Surface Disease Program. And next, you'll hear from Dr. Sam Gard, who's the Medical Director for the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat, or you can save them until the end of the lecture, and the doctors will field your questions then. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you so much, Dana. And thank you everyone for joining tonight and uh, giving us an hour of your time. It's a pleasure to have everyone here. Um, both Dr. Garg and I are always uh, so enjoy giving these lectures and connecting with our community and our patients out there. Um, tonight, we have the great privilege of also being uh, joined by Dr. May Skins, who is um, going to share a beautiful poem with us. Um, Dr. Frank May Skins is a distinguished professor of medicine emeritus, uh, founding director and senior advisor of the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and a previous patient of mine. And uh, we're very honored to have him tonight. So we're gonna begin the talk with his poem. I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and um, pull that up so everyone can enjoy it as well. All right, so here we are. Dr. Mayskin. Okay, I assume you'll move it when necessary. Yes. And. Um, I'm very grateful to be able to acknowledge the tremendous care I received by the Ophthalmology Institute and particularly Marjan for HMD. And this poem was written in honor of her in 2017 when I was treated for a very serious case of cataracts that uh, several people had missed. Here we go. The light becomes a glare. Edges fade, a bleak mirage appearing instead. Lecture slides, a blur on my consciousness. Guesswork driving becoming a dangerous ride. Faces become faceless, hidden from readings of intent. Understandings blunted or missed, affecting interpretation and response. Awkward moments and misspoken words seen as aging and senility. An eagle in flight, a mere flapping of wings no longer visible among the enveloping green mass. And then lenses removed and replaced, different realities emerge, a summer solstice in the dead of my winter, not to be forgotten, rescuing me from the abyss. Words and symbols sharp on the screen, driving no longer a hazardous adventure. Eagles reclaim the rightful place as magnificent. The spring rose is reclaimed and leaves me breathless. Technology at its best and a master of her craft, almost alchemy in the hands of a magician, a new lens engineered to remove the blindfold, the word now beaming with clarity and beauty, sights unseen, seen again. Thank you, Dr. Fareed. Thank you so much, doctor. That was really an honor to have you as a patient and an honor um, to have this beautiful poem. It really does capture um, you know, we from our side are very scientific in how we approach this, but there is certainly a um, profound impact on many patients who have suffered from vision loss, from cataracts, and um, our technology is able to uh, replace and, and restore vision again. So thank you for sharing that poem. So I'm going to jump with that right into a little bit on the background of cataracts. And I know Dr. Garg's lecture is going to talk about the 
um, innovative new technologies that can really take cataract surgery to the next level. So we'll talk about what a cataract is, reasons for its formation, its impact on the elderly and driving, uh, what it involves in the preoperative evaluation when you see your doctor, um, the process of cataract surgery, the postoperative care, postoperative signs of complications. So if we look at the anatomy of, of the eye, uh, the lens, which sits right here, sort of in the front uh, you know, center of the eye is really the lens of the camera, if you think of the uh, eye as a camera, and it focuses light. When we're younger, this lens is nice and clear and it focuses the light. It's able to sh uh, change its shape so that we're able to see distance as well as near. Around the age of 40 or 45, that lens gets stiffer. So a lot of patients at that age uh, develop what's called presbyopia, where it's difficult to focus that lens to be able to see up close most often. And that being able to shift distance and near um, starts becoming more difficult. And then over time, that stiffening uh, gets worse, and then it, the lens becomes opacified. And that's when we call it a cataract. So it's an opacification or clouding of the natural crystalline lens. And this process starts really at the age of, you know, 40s in our 40s, uh, where it starts becoming dysfunctional. And we call that, uh, we give it a number sometimes called the dysfunctional lens index. But it causes poor focus, focusing of light, it scatters light, so often causing glare um, as one of its early symptoms. Um, most of the time, this is a consequence of aging. I tell patients, if you have gray hair, you have a cataract usually. So, um, you know, it, it's a normal process. It's, it's not necessarily a disease, but a process of normal aging. Um, but some families will develop more dense cataract earlier. Some, you know, genetically will develop later. Other risk factors include uh, exposure to UV light. Diabetic patients tend to get cataracts a little earlier. If there's trauma to the eye, if there are um, history of medications such as steroids, those things will all push cataract formation to occur a little bit earlier. And cataracts can have many different uh, forms and shapes and different parts of the lens that gets cloudy. So this bottom picture shows a total hypermature cataract. This uh, upper picture shows more of a congenital central cataract but both of these are very visually significant as they're, as they're right in the center of the vision. So the symptoms, usually I tell patients some of the earliest symptoms you notice is glare at night, especially while driving, um, blurring of the vision, needing more light to read, uh, feeling like things are getting darker and you just can't get enough light, decrease in contrast sensitivity, um, these are early signs of cataracts formation. And glasses sometimes don't help with this, right? Um, a lot of uh, patients will tell me their glasses prescription keeps shifting. They just can't get the right prescription to get their vision better. And that's usually because of the cataract. Only late, late um, in the form, you know, the cataract uh, process does it become so dense that it, it, you lose vision from it. So in this country, fortunately, we don't see it. We're very, um, you know, our technology is so good. I don't wait for my patients to, to get to the point of not being able to see to go ahead with cataract surgery. So as soon as uh, patients have those early symptoms of glare and uh, trouble with light, we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed with cataract surgery. Um, our population is getting older. So as an industry ophthalmologist, we're seeing cataract patients a lot more. Our clinics are getting so much busier as both Dr. Garg and I can attest to. And so, uh, you know, the technology is also continuing to uh, advance. Um, and uh, we have a lot of cool things that help us do this cataract surgery in, uh, in very sophisticated ways. So uh, visual loss in the early, elderly, one out of three patients um, in the uh, over the age of 65 population has vision loss related to cataracts. Uh, daily activities are curtailed. Sometimes there's loss of independent living. Um, less mobility can result in falls and fractures, certainly, which we don't want. Um, and it can lead to social isolation and depression. So cataracts has a psychosocial impact as well. Third leading cause of blindness in the United States is cataract. From a public health standpoint, uh, for every 100,000 miles driven, 
older adults have a higher crash rate than do other age groups. And the number one reason for that is vision. Certainly cognitive and physical changes um, account for some of that, but the number one cause of car crashes in the elderly is due to uh, vision problems. Um, and certainly with our aging population, we're seeing the, fast, the fastest growing group of drivers are the elderly. So for us um, as ophthalmologists and cataract surgeons, really when I have a patient who is driving and is starting to have symptoms with glare at night, difficulty seeing street signs, you know, there's no reason to wait beyond that point. Um, our goal really you'll see in that red is to optimize the vision as soon as the symptoms um, become visually significant um, in active drivers. And this was a study that was done in um, uh, 2002, so it's a while ago, but cataract surgery, they looked at its impact on reducing uh, the risk of crashes, uh, driving crashes, and it reduced the risk by 50% in the elderly population. So you can see this is a picture of what somebody might see at night who has significant cataracts. Not only is everything blurry, but the light and the glare uh, from that light can really uh, wash out the image quite a bit. So what do we do when I see a patient who has cataract? We do a thorough medical and surgical history. Uh, we want to make sure patients are healthy to undergo cataract surgery. We record uh, the vision as well as their current glasses, do a detailed eye examination. We have a lot of technical uh, imaging technology to be able to determine uh, the lens power and the total health of the eye. And then patient education, which is really a critical, critical part of cataract surgery. So we're gonna do some of that today. And then of course we got a consent for procedure. Um, so how do we do cataract surgery? A 99%, maybe even more than that, um, it's performed under topical anesthesia. That means the patient is awake, we numb the eye, we give a little bit of IV sedation, very light. Uh, most patients don't need a whole lot just to take the sort of stress off and, and the anxiety and to make patients relax. General anesthesia really only for kids or maybe adults who have claustrophobia or patients who are unable to hold still who might have a, a significant um, head tremor, for example, we may wanna then do general anesthesia. Surgical time is somewhere between six to 15 minutes, but standard cataract surgery on average, I tell my patients is under 10 minutes. So it's, it's very straightforward. And you know what a lot of patients ask me is I'm on blood thinners, do I need to come off my blood thinners? And the answer is no. Cataract surgery is really a bloodless surgery and, and uh, uh, you don't need to come off the blood thinners for that. So how do we do it? Basically make very small incisions, two millimeter and one millimeter incision. The cataract sits inside a capsular bag. It's a thin capsule that surrounds the lens. We make a little circular opening on the front we use ultrasound, what we call phaco emulsification technology to chop up the lens and suction that lens out of the eye. We leave that capsular bag intact. And in fact, that's where the new lens sits. So the new lens sits where uh, the natural lens used to sit within this capsular bag that's suspended in the middle of the eye. And there it is. So here's a quick short video. Uh, of cataract surgery. And so we make a little one millimeter incision on one side and we use a little bit of numbing medication on the inside of the eye to make sure the patient is numbed thoroughly. This is completely painless for the patient. Sorry, if you're squeamish, you might wanna look away for the next two or three minutes. We fill a little bit of a, of a viscoelastic or a gel-like substance to keep the eye nice and formed. And then we make a two and a half millimeter incision uh, on, on the other side. And now we use a very small forcep to create a opening in the capsule uh, of the bag. That's, it's, I kind of compare it to a little lentil. So you have the skin of the lentil and you're gonna make a little opening of, on the skin. This is called a capsulotomy. This can be done manually or it can be done with a laser. And Dr. Garg will talk about laser technology uh, in, his, in his portion of the talk. We loosen up that lens with fluid waves. Most of the cataract surgery, when we take out the cataract is done underwater. As you can see, there's a lot of fluid that's being irrigated constantly through the eye. And we use this little phaco emulsification and a second instrument to basically chop that cataract. And you'll see uh, we embed it and we chop it up. 
So you can see I've cut the pie into two pieces. We rotate that uh, cataract within the bag and we make another chop. And now we have a piece of pie and we can eat that piece of pie. We, this, the, this phaco emulsification has a suction or a vacuum component that helps break up that seg piece and suction it out. Now, the more dense the cataract, the more energy we have to use to break up that section. And then there's a little, what we call a cortical uh, part of the cataract. That's the outer layer of the cataract that uh, is suctioned out at the end. We do this very carefully so that we don't tear the capsule that surrounds that bag. If we tear the capsule, it makes placement of our new lens challenging. So that's one potential complication. It's pretty uncommon, but uh, you know that's one complication that occurs is that you can tear or rupture that capsule. So here we're removing the last bits of that cataract. We're, we will refill with that gel-like substance. We reform that bag. And now you'll see the new lens, which we're loading here. We load it into an injector, it's rolled up so we can use that same small incision and it's injected right into the capsule and you'll see that lens going in. Uh, the lens has two little legs on it called haptic. So those, you'll see that first leg coming in. It comes in like a taco and then it unfolds in the eye and sits right inside that capsule or bag. We use another little instrument to get that second leg nicely positioned, we center that lens, and then we take out the gel in the eye, and that's the final part. And what you'll see at the end is these incisions are self-sealing. So what we do is we use a little bit of fluid to hydrate the wounds. When you hydrate the wounds, the wound self-seals. And those, uh, you know, I tell patients not to do a lot of heavy lifting or exercise because there is no suture in the eye for about a week or two, and those wounds then heal up within a week or two at the most. And that's it. That is cataract surgery in a nutshell. All right. So intraocular lens implants, I'm not gonna go into this in much detail because Dr. Garg is gonna really delve into this. This lens technology now is fantastic. So we have the option to put in a standard monofocal lens in patients. We can set it for distance near or, uh, but it won't do both. And then we have lenses that do both. We call these lifestyle lenses. These are lenses that um, where the aim is to give the patients more spectacle independence. And there's more and more uh, modern technologies in this area. We have lenses that can correct astigmatism as well. Again, Dr. Garg will go over these in detail. We also have a laser and the laser can do parts of that cataract surgery um, and really, um, help with things like capsulotomy and astigmatism correction. And again, Dr. Garg will go over the details of that. And here's a, what sort of the laser, the eye looks like under the laser. So what do we do after cataract surgery? The patient goes home with a little clear shield on the eye just so they don't bang their eye, but you can use your eye right away. Eye drops are started right away and we keep patients on these antibiotic and anti-inflammatory drops for about a month. Um, I tell patients no heavy lifting for about a week, no yoga where you're doing head below heart uh, motions for long periods of time, no swimming for a couple of weeks. I have patients sleep with that eye shield for a few nights and we see the patient usually the next day and then in a few weeks and then in a few months. Um, success for cataract surgery is fantastic. It's one of the most successful surgeries done in the United States. Complications are extremely infrequent, but risk of infection with any surgery is there. That's why we put patients on antibiotic drops. Patients may have transitory intraocular pressure fluctuations. Things like retinal tears and detachments are very, very rare. Usually patients may be at a higher risk for that if they have a specific anatomy to their eye or previous pathology or an area where their retina might be weak. So we check all of that before the cataract surgery. And then one very, very common thing is what we call a PCO or a posterior capsular opacification. That's the membrane, that capsule behind the lens that over time gets a little hazy. And with younger patients, we see that within a few months with older, much older patients, sometimes it'll take longer, maybe a few years. And that we um, clean that up with a little laser procedure we do in the office. So you come in for a regular uh, check and we dilate the eyes. And if the membrane needs to be lasered, it only needs to be lasered once. We do that right in the clinic. It takes about a minute to do that. 
So in conclusion, cataract surgery uh, is the most common surgery performed in the United States. Uh, return to normal fit, uh, visual function and activity are quickly achieved. Risks of surgery are very low. So you don't need to wait until your cataract is ripe. That's a very old, uh, you know, that's back when we used to open, make huge incisions in the eye 40, 50 years ago, where they'd say you have to wait for your cataract to be ripe. That's no longer the case. And now we have really excellent lens options, laser options available for patients who really want the super precision so that uh, you achieve spectacle independence or at least spectacle less dependence on glasses. And again, this that, that'll sway us into Dr. Garg's talk um, and he'll talk about all the latest technology on that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Garg and we'll come back together at the end. So please, please save your questions and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, my turn. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, my name is Sam Garg. I'm one of the uh, other cornea cataract doctors here at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Um, so, you know, Dr. Freed really uh, laid out sort of the, the nuts and bolts of what to expect for uh, cataract surgery. You know, I'm going to go through some, some of the, the patient um, journey and then sort of some uh, more discussion points about you know, the different lenses and, and how we approach that, you know, really when we, when we're choosing the right lens for you, we're really choosing it for you, not for what your spouse had or your neighbor had or your best friend. We really want to individualize our uh, treatment option to you. And, and we do, we try to do a very good job of, of going through, uh, you know, the different lens options, um, both Dr. Fried and I, and, and, you know, all of our doctors are really in tune with uh, understanding how the eye works and and we know that even though we're putting this fancy lens in your eye or a regular lens in your eye, that two thirds of the focusing power of the eye happens at the ocular surface. And so really, you know, when we, when you come in and we say, Hey, uh, you know, you should be using these artificial tears, doing these warm compresses. It's not just to treat your dry eyes for before surgery, but it's also after surgery and, and the measurements that are driven by the health of the ocular surface really help us choose the right lens for you. We use questionnaires to help us decide what technologies may be a good idea for you. Certainly we have lots of different tests that we get um, to measure the, the shape of the eye, the anatomy of the eye, the proportions of the eye, the regularity of the eye, and all of these things help us then choose the right lens for you. And again, we're really, um, we really try to individualize our, our recommendations to you. Um, when it comes to expectations, you should know that there's no perfect lens uh, on the market. Uh, and um, so, you know, every lens has some compromise and, and we'll get through, we'll talk through some of that here as we go through some of the different lens technologies. So a questionnaire first is, you know, this one is um, given to us from the uh, National Eye Institute and it, it basically talks about your symptoms. And, you know, Dr. Fareed uh, very uh, eloquently talked about, you know, a cataract not needing to be right, but it has to be symptomatic and, and for insurance to cover your, your cataract surgery, you have to have symptoms and we have to be able to corroborate that with your physical exam. And so these are some of the questions we ask. Uh, also, we, we, we look at, you know, sort of when we have the different lens options, well, what do you want out of the surgery? And these are, these questions are more meant to get you thinking. And then for us to finish this up with discussion, um, and, you know, all of these, um, factors here and, and more than this is, is what we use to help uh, lead you in the right direction. And, and we'll, we'll give you a, a, we'll help you make that decision. We don't expect you to be able to make the decision on your own on what the right technology is for you. It, you know, we'll use our, our expertise to help you make that decision. Cataract surgery is not, um, it's not something that is, you can just do it, It's really, you know, in order to do it well, you have to be really meticulous and you have to be really detail oriented. And, and these are just some of the things that we look at when we're deciding um, what lens technology is right for our patients. And so it really is, there's, there's a lot that we look at that we take into uh, consideration when we're helping you choose the right lens technology for you or whether or not surgery is actually needed. Sometimes the best, you know, the best decision is to wait on surgery uh, until, it, until you're ready for it. Um, you know, astigmatism is a major factor in cataract surgery. And astigmatism basically means that your cornea, which is a front window of your eye, that you're going to keep after your surgery, 
is a little misshapen. And if it's misshapen in a way that we can fix it, we can treat that with either a lens implant or by using incisions in the cornea that we can create with a laser to minimize the astigmatism and uh, improve your visual outcome. Um, this is a, a vision simulator that, you know, that we have that sort of can show you what a cataract will do to your eye. You know, Dr. Fried talked about presbyopia and the lens hardening. Um, as you get a little bit older, the, the first thing to go is your near vision. As the cataract starts to get a little bit worse, things start to dim. And then if you put a, a standard lens in, you can correct for distance. Uh, but the newer technologies allow us to get distance and near. Um, one of the challenges with some of these lenses that give you distances near is that sometimes you can get some halo and glare at night. And so showing here on this, on this uh, schematic, as you can see, you know, with the multifocal lens, you get, you can see distance near, but you see these little halos around uh, point sources of light. And every lens has its own sort of side, of, side effect profile. Um, Dr. Uh, Fareed talked about the intraocular lens implant options, you know, the standard lens really being our um, go-to lens for a lot of patients. Um, you know, it's the one that's covered by your insurance. And, you know, with that lens, um, it gives really great vision for either distance or near, but not both. Uh, if you've done monovision in the past, which is where one eye is offset for the other eye, um, you can do that. But if you've never tried that before, sometimes it's not, um, your brain just can't get used to it. And so it's not something you want to do if you've never tried it in the past, uh, most times, sometimes you can still do it. And, you know, and you can talk to your doctor about the, the pros and the cons of that. A toric IOL, as I mentioned, uh, can do the same thing, but also correct for astigmatism. So when we say toric, that means astigmatism. Uh, but what's really exciting about ophthalmology and, and, and where we've gone with our lenses is the ability to reverse uh, presbyopia. And presbyopia, again, is this stiffening of your, of your lens. It doesn't make a difference if you're nearsighted or farsighted. That lens becomes more stiff and things up close aren't as crisp as they were as, as when you were younger. And so um, the, the, you know, the classic treatment for this is reading glasses. Recently, uh, uh, Allergan uh, just introduced a new drop for presbyopia correction, which in the early stages of presbyopia can help a little bit, giving you some reading. But generally, as when you get to cataract age, you have to look at a technology to give you uh, a full range of vision if your eye is amenable. So current options to treat presbyopia include glasses, contact lenses, like I mentioned, monovision, uh, these drops, uh, but really the, the mainstay is going to be intraocular lenses. So current uh, presbyopia intraocular lenses, I will uh, mention that this is not all inclusive, uh, but these are sort of the ones that we have here, and I'll talk through some of these. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance. A lot of what I'm going to share here is, is very technical um, and probably uh, more doctor facing than patient facing, but uh, you'll get the idea of, of sort of the um, sort of the, the breadth of and, and the technology that we have uh, available to you as patients. Uh, so one lens that I'll talk about here is the Vividi lens. The Vividi lens is, is newer to the US market. It basically allows for a stretching of the, uh, of the focal point uh, of what you're trying to look at so that you get distance and, and generally you get really good intermediate vision, so computer vision. And if you look at this lens versus a standard lens, and again, being technical here, the gray line is uh, what we call a monofocal lens. So you get a zero is distance. You get really great vision at distance, but then when you go off to the near side, you don't get as much. Uh, so you really get the best vision at your distance focal point. Um, when you look at the blue line, that's the Vividi lens. You start to gain some vision up uh, at near as well. And so um, with this lens, it's, it's not considered a monofocal lens. It's considered an extended depth of focus lens. So you get this range of vision from distance to near. And the nice thing about this lens is that you don't get um, sort of sweet spots in your vision. So some lenses, you'll get distance and you'll get reading, but then in between, you won't get that. This lens allows for a nice range of vision. The Technus iHance is a very similar technology. Uh, again, um, with this range of vision, it's not technically considered a presbyopia correcting lens, but depends on how you use it. Sometimes you can get some good range of vision. Uh, this one's from Johnson & Johnson, really high quality lens. And, and this has really become our, our standard lens that we use for most patients. Um, and, and it's, it's uh, the newest technology out with respect to lenses. And it's been really, um, really great with giving excellent distance vision and some intermediate vision. 
Um, the nice thing about this lens is the quality of vision doesn't degrade in low light like some of the other technologies. And so you get really great contrast in, in well-lighted uh, situations and, and lower light situations. Uh, going back a few years and still popular lenses are what are called multifocal lenses. Uh, a, a better way to think about a multifocal lens is really, it's, it's really a bifocal lens. It gives, you, it gives you distance and it gives you reading. And that reading distance we can alter based on the, the, the model of that multifocal lens that we use. So if you want it to be a little bit further out, we have a lens to do that. If you want it to be a little closer, we have a, we have a lens that can do that. The downside to multifocal lenses is generally you need a, an overall healthy eye. So you can't have any major issues with macular degeneration or glaucoma or corneal scarring or irregular uh, irregularity of your optical system. Um, and, and you can get some halo and glare around point sources of light. The benefit is though, that you get this great range of vision and depending on how you use these lenses, most of us will use one technology in one eye and a, and a complementary technology in your fellow eye to give you this range of vision, you know, and people say, well, why would I want two different lenses in each eye? Well, we know that most people's eyes are not exactly the same. They're, they, they complement each other. And so if we can use that and um, use that to your advantage as a patient, we can use different technologies to give you different range of vision uh, with both eyes um, without it really being perceptible to you. And, and your brain is able to integrate that very, very easily for the most part. Um, the nice thing about these lenses is compared to more traditional multifocal lenses. If you, if you, you know, you had friends who had multifocal lenses placed 10 years ago, um, the incidence of glare and halo is much, much less than some of the more traditional lenses that we have, um, had in the past. Uh, extended depth of focus. Um, this is a, uh, you know, this lens is, is the symphony lens, uh, from Johnson and Johnston. Uh, it's a great lens because it gives you really predictable distance and intermediate. Uh, it's, it's good in eyes that may not be perfect. So if, if there are certain things and your doctor uh, deems them to be not all that significant from a health perspective to the eye, this is a great lens to give you some depth of focus, but it does carry uh, the side effect of having some halo and glare or, and some starbursts around point sources of light, uh, particularly at nighttime. Um, this lens, which is not named here, is really a lens that's become very, very popular over the last uh, few years. It's called a trifocal lens. So instead of being a multifocal, which has two focal points, this is a trifocal lens. So it has three focal points. And by giving you this third focal point, you get great distance vision, great intermediate vision, and very functional near vision. And so compared to just say a, a the symphony lens, you get this better near vision, um, with, with something like a trifocal lens. Um, the newest lens that we actually have on the market in the US is what's called the Synergy lens. This combines both multifocal and extended depth of focus. Again, most of this is beyond what you need to know as a patient, but what you wanna know is that there are lenses that can give you different ranges of vision. And then our job as doctors is to talk you through the various technologies and talk about the pros and the cons and what you may be a candidate for and not a candidate for, and to try to figure out what's the best option for you. Uh, what I didn't mention is all of these technologies that I mentioned previously come in a stigmatism correcting version. And that's been a game changer for us and for you. Uh, previously, most of these technologies only came in, um, in options that we couldn't correct for astigmatism. So if you had a lot of astigmatism, a, you know, one and a half, two diopters of astigmatism, we were really limited on what we could give you. Now all of these um, manufacturers make the lens not just in a standard version, but also in a stigmatism correcting version. Um, again, this lens has performed very well compared to other lenses and uh, has, has really gives us the opportunity for the widest range of, of vision um, without uh, the need for glasses. I think what's, you know, one thing we try to do at, at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute is really stay on the cusp of um, what the newest technologies are that are meaningful technologies that will give us the best chance to give you, our patients, um, the, the outcome that you want. And one technology that we just recently introduced is what's called the light adjustable lens. And if you look at our, the current sort of um, patient journey for a, uh, a lifestyle lens or a premium lens, 
you know, we do this assessment, we try to figure out what's the right lens for you, what are the trade-offs, we make a choice, we do our measurements, we put the lens in the eye, and then we evaluate how you do afterwards. And if there's an error, uh, which is rare, but can happen, especially in eyes that have had LASIK or eyes that may be a little misshapen for, for whatever reason, uh, our predictability goes down. Now we have a technology that where we can do the surgery, let you try out the lens, and then we can adjust the lens based on what you, um, what you want out of the lens postoperatively. And so this is called the light adjustable lens. Uh, it's made by a local company here called RX Sight. And the lens is made of a polymer that is photosensitive that allows us to change it within, within a range postoperatively. So you put the lens in, you let the eye heal, and then you try it out and you say, well, gosh, you know, I wish I had a little better near vision out of my right eye. We can, we can put that in. And then you could try it out for a week. And if you say, you know what, I really, I really like that. Then we can lock that into place. Um, the downside to this lens is that you have to wear these UV blocking glasses for several weeks after surgery. Cause you, what you don't want is ambient UV light to, to lock the lens into place when you're not ready for it. Uh, so it's a really exciting technology that we're really, really, um, you know, pleased to be able to offer our patients. Uh, this is a new lens that should be coming out uh, probably this year. This lens will be really good for people with sort of aberrated corneas, people who have had radial keratotomy, uh, post-corneal transplant, uh, really uh, LASIK that maybe didn't go as well and may have um, some, um, some irregularity to it. It's called the IC8 lens. Again, a, another local company. Uh, so we're really excited to try this. And I think that the cool thing about this is pinhole optics are really forgiving. So if something is not perfect in the eye, the pinhole optic can really give us really great quality of vision without a lot of downside. Um, so now I'm going to shift to different technologies that are associated with cataract surgery. One of them is laser cataract surgery that Dr. Fareed alluded to, and I, we're running a little bit behind time. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. You know, the standard cataract surgery, you have an incision, you make your capsular rexus that Dr. Fareed showed so nicely in her video. You take out the cataract. Uh, and then you put in the lens and you have to make sure that the lens is centered. Um, and if it's not centered, that can have issues. And then you can treat the astigmatism. Uh, and when you treat astigmatism with a blade, you know, sometimes our hands aren't as, as steady as you'd want. And so uh, a laser may allow for a better option for that. And that's what this does. It allows for a perfectly radial and symmetric incision. Um, so when you do laser assisted cataract surgery, we image the eye, it can do the incisions, it can do our capsulotomy. Uh, you know, Dr. Freed um, referred to it as a lentil. I like to call it a little M&M &M inside the eye. Um, and you basically take the shell off the M&M. &M. Then you can pre-soften that, that lens. And that's really useful in really dense cataracts. And then you can do these incisions for your, um, for your astigmatism. This is all customized to you. So we get a, a live image of your eye on the on the table and we put in our safety zone. So we deliver the laser exactly where we want it. Uh, we can make our incisions with any um, architecture and that allows for self-sealing incisions uh, and more predictability. Um, the, um, the hole in the, in the M&M &M is, is perfectly round and that has implications in lens centration and tilt. The lens is pre-softened so it comes out easier, which allows for faster visual recovery, less damage to, to the delicate structures inside the eye. Like I mentioned, the incisions for astigmatism correction are very, very precise um, and, um, and perfect. And then um, your, our incisions are, are, are great as well. Uh, here's a quick video on, uh, on the uh, femtosecond laser surgery. And I'll just go through the actual femtosecond part of it here. But um, you can see the uh, trying to, let's see if I can edit, move through this here. Okay, you're gonna to have to trust me on this here. Let's see. Um, here, let's see if this works. I apologize. Okay, so we'll play it here. Can you guys still see the video, I hope? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here's, here's the, the, the capsule. I mean, so here's the imaging that I talked about. Here's the imaging of the cornea and the lens. And then um, making sure we plan our incision. And, and then here's the actual delivery of the laser. And you can see here it's very quick. It's going in and it's pre-softening. This was a very dense cataract for this patient. Um, and by, by chopping up that cataract with the laser, 
you, you avoid using excess uh, ultrasound energy to remove the lens. Um, and then it'll make our, our very perfect and, um, and perfectly placed astigmatic incisions. And then, and, and then last thing is our, our corneal incision. Uh, then we move to the, to the operating room. And instead of having to make a hole in the M&M, I just have to pull out the cap. And then I can remove the, uh, the cataract here. And then lastly, place our lens. And this is a, a multifocal lens going into place. And you'll see that um, this is a perfectly centered lens. And so the centration is really important when it comes to cataract surgery. And so the fact that we have a technology that can allow for that and aid us in that is, is really, um, is really been very nice for us and our patients and, and more importantly, our outcomes. So let me go back to the video or the presentation here. Okay. Um, the other technology we have has to do with, with uh, astigmatism management. And when we look at astigmatism, uh, astigmatism um, is really based on how the eye is measured. And if someone's tilted, when we measure them and we try to go in and do our, our procedure, um, it, it can be hard to know where to place that lens. So think of a, a, a astigmatism lens sort of having to be placed like uh, at a particular axis on a clock. And so by using a technology, and this is a technology called uh, the Callisto or markerless guidance, I'm able to know exactly where your eye was when I took the picture and then know, know where I want to put the lens in based on uh, very advanced measurements that we take and calculations, and then use this technology to then put the lens exactly where I want it. Even if you're on the table, your head is tilted or... Uh, the eye was rotated. There's something called cyclotorsion that can happen where the eyes rotate. So when you turn your head this way, the whole world doesn't move. Everything stays straight. It's because your eye rotates. And, and when you're on the table, that can happen. And you can see here that the, the lens, these four dots on this lens are perfectly lined up with the, uh, with the blue lines. And so this is another technology that we have that helps us give you the best outcome possible. The last thing that we have is called intraoperative aberrometry. So one thing we know is that uh, our measurements are, um, are really, really good in general, but there are some problem eyes and uh, some of those eyes include eyes that have had LASIK in the past. Uh, and so this technology allows us to place uh, or to, to re-measure your eye on the table. So once we remove your cataract, we're able to re-measure your eye and it gives us another data point that helps us then choose the right lens for you. Um, this is different than the light adjustable lens where the light adjustable lens we can, we can change after the fact, after the lens is in your eye. This is, this is where we're using a technology that is not the light adjustable lens that uh, maybe we want that multifocal lens or we want that extended depth of focus lens or that trifocal lens. And we want to try to be as accurate as possible. Um, we use intraoperative aberrometry to help us make those decisions. And so the way this works is, let's see if this starts here. There we go. So the way this works is we we're, when the patient's on the table, we, we uh, have the patient look at a little red light on the table, and then it quickly measures the, um, the, the shape of the eye, and it helps us determine the, the power of the lens and also the magnitude and axis of the astigmatism. And then we're able to help us use that to guide proper lens selection. And so, you know, cataract surgery is very technical and there's a lot of math and the more data, in my opinion, the better. And so this allows me then to have multiple data points to help then choose the right lens for you. So if you look at your experience at Gavin Herbert Institute, you know, we have board certified experienced surgeons, uh, many of us are nationally recognized for cataract surgery and corneal surgery. Uh, we teach at national and international courses. Uh, we're training the next generation of surgeons. So the surgeons that are going to be in, you know, in Orange County and beyond for the next many years, we're the ones training them. Uh, we certainly have expertise in routine and complex cases. Uh, what I didn't add here is we also do a lot of complication management. So if things don't go right. Uh, oftentimes those patients come to us and we're the ones who 
to try to help those patients. And, and really, I think we offer the right technology at the right time. And what I mean by that is we have experience with nearly every single um, cataract technology that's available. And whether or not we offer it here, we have experience with it and we, we know about it. And we've really cho chosen the, the technologies that we think are really meaningful to give you, our patients, the best outcome. Um, this is a list of all of our cataract surgeons, including Dr. Farid and myself. We have Dr. Matt Wade, Sanjay Kadar, Olivia Lee, Same Mosaed, Ken Lin, and Austin Fox. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And with that, I think we'll move to uh, some time for question and answer. That's right. Does anybody, thank you very much, Dr. Garg and Dr. Freed. That was fabulous. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask the doctors? We can unmute you or you can pop them in the chat and we can read them. I see Sabina has her hand up. Let me see if we can unmute Sabina. Hold on. Sabina, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, I am. Can you? Oh, hear great. Okay. Um, I have. I had a multifocal lens in my right eye, which did a lot for the distance. It did nothing for my close vision. Uh, in fact, made it worse. And my actually, the idea was to be able to read. So I was wondering, how do you? intervene how do you fix that can you do anything about that other than taking out the lens which you can't do at this point uh is there anything that can be done about yeah I mean, I'll, I'll take that one um i think um the, the the honest answer is we don't know until you get examined and we see what's going on there's there's a lot of factors that can be um at play when it comes to uh, a patient's vision postoperatively from you know being off uh, with with the lens power uh, or depending on the technology, sort of explaining what the what the real you know uh, how much near vision you actually get with the technology. They're not all the same. Some give a little bit more reading. Some give less. Um, is there anything else going on with your eyes? So really, what I would do is is maybe schedule an appointment with one of our surgeons that I that were on that list. Uh, to take a look and see if there's anything that can be done. Um, it, depending on how long ago you had it done, uh, you're right. Sometimes taking these lenses out can uh, maybe not worth the risk. Um, and it may be better just to get a pair of, of over-the-counter reading glasses. But really, it's hard for us to, to give you um, any kind of uh, real you know, opinion on it without getting a look at you. Thank you. There's a couple of questions in the chat that I can uh, try to help with. One question was, do you treat one eye at a time? Most of us, yes, we usually treat, if, if your cataracts are going together, we'll usually treat one at a time, usually a week apart. Yeah, that way yeah. you don't have to kind of be lopsided for longer than that. And, and if you're wanting to get rid of your glasses, then you're done. Um, sometimes we'll wait longer between the eyes, depending on your specific case. Rarely, I will do a patient, both eyes on the same day, but those are patients who might be sick and may not be able to go through surgery twice, or there's some special circumstances for those. But the majority of time, we do one eye at a time. Will the cataract grow back after surgery? No, it does not. The only thing that happens after surgery is that membrane that gets hazy, that PCO that may at some point down the road need a little in-office laser procedure. Um, they're, they're continue to come in. Are there treatments other than surgery for cataracts? No, not yet. Unfortunately, surgery is really what we do now for cataract surgery and for the foreseeable future. Sam, do you want to take the next? Yeah. Two? So, so, okay. So question from uh, Jessica, given that you train students, do you ever have students perform uh, the cataract surgery. So our, our residents have their own panel of patients. So if, uh, if you are having surgery by a resident, it's, it's made known up front. Uh, and so most of our residents get most of their experience at the VA hospital. Uh, so unless you're a veteran, um, uh, it, it, the, if you come to Gavin Herbert Institute, one of the faculty is going to be doing your surgery. The person that you consult with will be doing your surgery, not, uh, not someone else. So um, that's, uh, that's that, uh, do surgeons need to use a different technique for different lenses? Um, so the answer is generally not generally the cataract removal is very similar depending on the eye. Uh, you may need to treat the astigmatism differently 
Um, and you know, either uh, you'll use a laser or not. Um, what I didn't mention is that a lot of these technologies um, are not covered by insurance. So I, I think that's an important point to bring up. The standard cataract surgery, uh, the monofocal lens is, is covered by your insurance, but uh, pretty much all the other technologies that I mentioned are not. And so there's an out-of-pocket cost that um, is a uh, patient uh, pay that they pay for that part of it. Um, can we replace a lens later? In general, you know, you can if there's something uh, very wrong with the lens or if it's malfunctioning or if there's a health problem with the eye. We typically don't go in just swap lenses or swap lenses unless there's, unless there's something uh, majorly wrong with the eye. There is some technologies down the pike that are, are what we call modular lenses that will allow for that, but so far nothing yet is uh, commercially available. Um, let's see here. I understand uh, the need. I understand need for patients determines the type of lens. But what is the most common one you, uh, your institute uses so far? I think that's um, I think that's doctor specific, and I, I really think it's patient specific. I think we use such a wide variety of lenses that we really try to individualize it. Uh, we each sort of have our our favorite lenses, and 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 um, you know, and you know, depending on who you consult with, they would talk to you why they think that's your. Um, your, your best lens for you. You want to take the next one here, Marjan? Yeah, sure. No, just to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. We, I mean, I think we use all, all of the lenses, really all of the technology. Uh, we really study all of these, the physics of these lenses specifically. We look at the data on these patients too. So these lenses all go through a rigorous FDA approval process. And there's a lot of patients and data behind that. So, uh, you know, I, I look at that data and see, you know, how patients perform when a new lens, for example, becomes available. So it, we really are, um, uh, you know, have the ability to use all of these lenses and, and do use uh, and, and tailor to the specific patient. Uh, what is the timing of cataract surgery if a patient also has thyroid eye disease with proptosis? and superior and inferior thinning of the nerve fiber layer that requires orbital decompression surgery. So uh, if you have thyroid eye disease and it's very active and there's um, surgery of the orbit that's required, those you know, should happen first. Usually uh, those are more urgent, um, you know, unless the cataract is blinding, which is usually not in you know, most cases. Um, we prefer the patient to be stable from that standpoint, from the inflammation of their orbit before uh, we go ahead with cataract surgery. Uh, wavefront lens is really, um, all of these newer lenses are wavefront corrected. That means that um, they have, uh, they're, they're really um, try to correct for some of the uh, halos or the optical aberrations from the cornea. So all of these more newer lenses have wavefront um, correction to them. At what point does a patient need cataract surgery? Uh, so, you know, a, a, in a patient who is actively driving, then I say a, a surgery when you're starting to have symptoms such as glare at night when you're driving, or if you're noticing you need more light to read and, and vision is getting more difficult to correct, you don't need to wait until you can't see. That's usually very late and it makes surgery more difficult as well. So um, if you're not driving and, and you're um, home, you know, things like reading, uh, uh, watching TV, doing the things you enjoy, when those things start becoming difficult, then we'll go ahead and do the cataract surgery. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, that, you know, you also want to just be willing and able uh, to go through the surgery and being accepting of the risks. So, you know, cataract surgery is very, very safe, exceptionally safe. There's, you know, in the United States, almost 4 million cataract surgeries done a year. And it's by far, uh, if you look at studies, uh, you know, one of the most successful surgeries by every metric you look at from, you know, people getting back to work, from satisfaction, from safety, uh, but you have to be wanting to do it. And so uh, it's something that we will recommend, but really uh, when you say you're ready, we're happy to help you. Um, at what point, uh, let's see, do cataract uh, surgery? Okay, sorry. Uh, I had cataract surgery 14 years ago and recently noticed a terrible glare. Again, I think this is something that you need to come in and, and, and be evaluated for uh, these specific um, issues with respect to surgery. It's hard for us to tell you uh, without actually looking at you. So any of our doctors would be happy to to consult with you and see if there's something that can be done for your glare. Uh, does the severity of cataract affect the outcome of the surgery? 
Um, yes and no. I think sometimes if it's a very, very dense cataract, um, you can have a little bit longer recovery. Uh, but you also get a little bit more out of the, the wow factor because you, you'll notice the brightness and the clarity uh, much more than someone who has a very mild cataract. And so, uh, but gen generally cataracts that are much more dense, uh, you have a little higher chance for some swelling of your cornea that's transient. Uh, that may take a day or two or maybe even a couple of days longer to go away. That's really a, a great case for using a laser because uh, the laser can help um, soften up that cataract to make it come out uh, much more gently. Um, do you at times recommend to do one eye at a time or both eyes together? I think uh, Dr. Freed uh, discussed this. We generally do one eye at a time. There's rare cases where we'll do both eyes at the same setting. So the next question is about keratoconus. We're patient with keratoconus. Does that affect, is, are there special pre, uh, precautions or placement of lens issues? So keratoconus is a, is a dystrophy of the cornea that uh, it causes a little misshapen or irregular astigmatism in patients who have keratoconus. So yeah, uh, doing lens power measurements is a little bit more challenging in patients with keratoconus. Uh, we really uh, go have to do special measurements for patients with keratoconus. The surgery itself is still the same whether you have keratoconus or not. Uh, if it's a keratoconus that's stable, uh, then again, we'll, we'll choose the lens that's the most appropriate, whether it's astigmatism correcting or not, based on the, the degree of keratoconus you have. Great question. I hope that answers it. Uh, you know, if you uh, raise your hand, if we didn't answer anything uh, correctly, we're, we're happy to stay on a few minutes longer and, and chat further. Thank you so much for your attention. Maybe we'll turn it back to Dana. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. Um, we think we've covered all the questions. If you have any, please feel free to email us and we'll get the questions to the doctors and try to get a response for you. Um, we are just coming up for eight o'clock. So we're right on time, but I wanna remind you that on uh, Tuesday, February 4, 1st is another one of our community lectures on oculoplastics about sags and bags. And that'll be, um, uh, presented by Dr. Uh, Idiri Wickrama. So if you're interested in that, check out our website, register there, or send us an email and we'll register for you. With that in mind, thank you very much. We hope you'll join us for lectures coming up this year and uh, you'll come to the Gavin Hubbard Eye Institute for all your eye care needs. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.